Welcome environmentalist, and we'll be on our lesson involving natural disasters for winter storms and tropical cyclones, a very intriguing topic, and I hope you enjoy it. This is lecture 13, only seven more to go till we're done with the semester. So what are our objectives to be learning today? We're going to identify how winter storms form, and we're going to look at historically significant winter storms in North America. We're going to look at how tropical cyclones form. You would know them as hurricanes. And then what are the different types of tropical cyclones? What are hurricane characteristics and historically significant hurricanes within our area? So let's start with winter storms. Winter storms form via processes similar to thunderstorms. So as we're thinking about what we learned a few lectures ago in cyclonic uh, <clears throat> winter storms form via processes similar to thunderstorms. So as we think back to the formation of thunderstorms and the cyclones that form there, the mesocyclones, it's very similar for a winter storm. The process is intensified by the primary air masses that adjust and shift with the seasons, going back to the lettering of the various different air masses that we learned about in our air disturbances and looking at tornadoes. The primary difference between a rainstorm and a winter storm is the, is the temperature, obviously, and the type of precipitation. So thunderstorms uh, can also produce precipitation that's frozen. We learned about hail. But a winter storm is a bit different because of how the precipitation is impacted. So let's take a look at how this works. The intensifying or intensity of a winter storm varies according to, but not limited to, some of these reasons. The surface temperatures, and if they're cooler, that's going to produce a potential for snow to fall. The strength of clashing air masses, especially if they're polar or uh, some of the Arctic masses that we learned about. And then the location of the freeze line and humidity. All of these factors impact, as you can see, where the freeze line might be in the height of the cloud and also the type of air mass that you might be dealing with. So winter storms, while we may not experience them 100% of the time where you live in the winter, they are common in certain areas. So what are winter storms? People are just regular drizzle and rain, then it moves and escalates into sleet, then we can get dry snow and wet snow. What's the difference? We'll be learning about all of them. First, let's start with a blizzard. It's a snowstorm with sustained winds over 35 miles an hour and lasting longer than three hours. Not a fun thing to be involved with. I was in Canada doing night skiing on a choir tour uh, competition, and a friend of mine and I got stuck on a um, ski lift, and a whiteout occurred, a blizzard. And it's totally quit the ski lift. Some people tried to drop off and actually broke their legs. Um, it was none of our people, but some of the others that were there. So I can remember hanging on to my friend. The both of us held on to each other for warmth and uh, just because we're scared to death. But they got it operational about 20, 30 minutes into the storm. And I have never understood what chilled to the bone was until that night because it was minus zero. I mean, we're talking like it was minus 15 degrees and almost minus 20. And with howling winds and the blizzard and the whiteout. So other definitions include visibility under a quarter mile because of frozen precipitation. So having been in a blizzard and a whiteout, I can tell you they're not something that you necessarily want to endure if at all possible. What's a ground blizzard? caused by high winds relocating previously deposited snow. So it'd be like snow uh, mounds get moved and uh, they migrate. And so these can accompany a traditional blizzard, but should be thought of more like a dust storm consisting of snow. They look like clouds on the satellite, but they're actually snow on the ground. A whiteout is kind of what I experienced in Canada. I've experienced it elsewhere as well, but indoors, I'm happy to say. A dense blizzard that reduces visibility to zero. This is a very dangerous place to be if you're on the road. Whiteouts can be caused by ground blizzards, uh, air, meaning 
atmospheric blizzards or combination of both. In either case, a whiteout is very devastating because you don't know it's coming your way and they don't know if you're coming their way. The best thing to do is either to press forward and take your chances or pull over if you have the right emergency gear. That's why it's important to keep the emergency gear that you might need, food, water, uh, extra clothing and blankets in your trunk along with flashlights and maybe even a flare so people can find you. Now we're not done with our lecture yet but this is an early science servings. One of the snowiest places in the world is Mount Baker in Washington State. I've been there. Pretty awesome place. Snowfall levels reached 1,140 inches during the 1998 to 1999 season. I can't even imagine how that must have been if you were trying to shovel snow every day. New York City spends about $1.8 million per inch of winter precipitation for ice and snow cleanup. Think about the amount of people and population that we learned about early in this semester in the New York City area in New Jersey, all coming into the heart of New York. They have to find a way to let people to continue to work and operate, which requires extensive uh, around-the-clock services. Let's look at record winter storms. The Great White Hurricane of 1888. This occurred in the March of 1888 and is still the worst blizzard on record to this very date. It dumped 50 inches of snow in Massachusetts and Connecticut with 40 inches in New York and New Jersey. Pretty incredible. Can you imagine? Central Park recorded temperatures between 6 and to 9 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 mile per hour winds. Now if you tried to walk in a hurricane, if you've been in one and I have been in one, this would be like hurricane type force winds. So as we look at some of the hurricane and tropical storm winds shortly, you'll go, wow, that's like a category one. And it's uh, very scary to think about that and the precipitation coming down in the form of, of snow. Of course, it takes a lot of snow to equal one inch of rain when it melts. But imagine the problem when this, this stuff starts melting, the snow uh, stormwater runoff they're going to have problems with. The blizzards of 2010. In the year 2010, we experienced three blizzards during the year, two in February and one in December across the United States, and globally is one of the oddest years on record for winter storms. Waco received the most snow ever recorded in one day. I can remember making snow angels. I had uh, moved into where I live now, and it was my first full winter there. And it was so much fun to get on the patio. They closed down school. You know, if you have a glacial moment in Waco, you got to close down the entire city. But it was very strange. And these are even pictures taken from Waco, looking at uh, the trees and how those fell on power lines. And, of course, that in ends up being a pretty wide-scale problem. And when you look at the blizzards of 2010 from satellite images, they look like gigantic hurricanes, don't they? They're in the, storm, in the form of snow. So they are like cyclones, and they just are made of different material. So here's some pictures of some of the areas in Waco that you might recognize by the suspension bridge and some of the roads uh, in Cameron Park. This was a record year. This here's the suspension bridge right here. These pictures are courtesy of Brad Turner. And that's a lot of snow. So let's look at tri tropical cyclones. So we're going to shift gears from the precipitation that's wintery stuff to the stuff that's water. So what's a tropical cyclone? A cyclone is a closed atmospheric circulation rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Tropical cyclones are a warm core non-frontal storm originating over tropical or subtropical waters with organized deep convection in a closed surface wind circulation about a well-defined center, which you would know as the eye. So in the northern hemisphere, remember, it's going to rotate counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, it rotates clockwise. So I've traveled down to New Zealand and Australia and South America, and I can tell you I've done the water watch the water go down the drain and really see if it does it different and the further away you get from the equator the more obvious this process becomes 
So let's look at the formation of a hurricane known as a tropical cyclone. Hurricanes are beautifully organized storms of destruction, part of a family of storms called tropical cyclones. Those impacting the United States typically develop between June and late November, just north of the equator, in the tropical to subtropical waters of the Pacific Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, and the Atlantic Ocean. While some mystery surrounds the exact origins of hurricanes, tropical disturbances such as clusters of thunderstorms accelerate the process by generating a column of rising air and a zone of low pressure. Pushed by the trade winds, the disturbance becomes a spinning mass of thunderclouds, growing as warm, moist air sweeps into the low pressure void. Due to the Earth's Coriolis effect, the cloud mass always rotates counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. As wind speeds exceed 74 miles per hour, a hurricane is born. Hurricanes vary in intensity from a category one hurricane with winds between 74 and 95 miles per hour up to a category five hurricane with winds greater than 155 miles per hour. The central area of lowest pressure is called the eye of the hurricane, a calm, often cloud-free area from 4 to 40 miles across. Immediately surrounding the eye is the eye wall, a cylindrical band of highest winds and the location of the storm's most concentrated violence. Air at the sea surface is sucked towards the eye and thrust upwards in the eye wall after forming rain bands on its trip inward. As it rises, moist air cools, causing water to condense as a fine mist or ice, while releasing huge amounts of heat. An average hurricane releases heat equivalent to the total electrical energy consumed annually in the United States. This liberated heat causes air to rise even further, producing more condensation and releasing still more heat. In this manner, a hurricane drives itself pulling in moisture-laden, warm air at its base, extracting heat and water, and then propelling the air outward near elevations of 50,000 feet. Huge amounts of rainfall are often a byproduct of this energy transfer, with as much as 20 inches of rain measured beneath a passing storm. Flash floods associated with this rainfall can cause extensive erosion, carrying large volumes of sediment seaward. Hurricanes are pushed by the trade winds at up to 20 miles per hour, generally traveling from their low latitude origins toward the poles. Once over cold water or land, a hurricane's warm water energy supply is cut, causing it to weaken and die. The most destructive region of a hurricane extends from the eye wall out through the right semicircle of the storm. Here, the forward motion of the hurricane adds speed to the counterclockwise spinning winds. These high winds combine with the storm's low atmospheric pressure, producing elevated sea level that moves as a lens-like bulge beneath the storm. Hurricanes on the open ocean can produce 60-foot waves and strong currents more than 200 feet below the surface. These waves and currents are capable of moving large objects and can severely scour the ocean bottom as the hurricane nears land. At landfall, the bulge in sea level becomes a life-threatening flood called a storm surge, which, depending on the topography, can extend inland many miles, reaching over 25 feet above mean sea level. Waves and currents working with the storm surge deliver a high energy assault on the coast, destroying homes, uprooting vegetation, and moving entire beaches in just hours.
That video did a really good job of explaining the key parts of a hurricane, but one element that they focused on was the heat that hurricanes obtain from the ocean. This is a term called latent heat of condensation, guaranteed test question. This is the energy released when water vapor condenses to form liquid, and that happens because we got warm surface temperatures on the ocean, and that helps fuel up a hurricane. That's typically why hurricanes don't form in November, December, February, March, those time frames, because there's just not hot enough surface temperatures to do it. So latent heat of condensation is what keeps a hurricane growing. So it could be that a hurricane makes landfall, let's say in Florida, and then bounces back into the Gulf of Mexico. It can refuel itself by latent heat of condensation. So remember that while the trop tropical cyclone is over the uh, warm ocean waters, that latent heat of con uh, condensation intensifies the storm and the energy that that storm can produce. When we look at tropical cyclones, they're really built into cells, and so those cells can have different characteristics. So the cells are also referred to as bands, and most of these are referred to as spiral bands, and you can see why right in here. This is a spiral set of bands, so each one of these represents these rain bands, and the storm's intensity could vary from band to band, and depending on what side of the eye that you're on. So the areas that we develop, tropical cyclones, actually originate sometimes all the way over uh, past South America into Africa off of the East Coast. And they'll start off as a tropical disturbance, they'll graduate to a tropical depression and then to a tropical storm and then to a hurricane. So as they come up and get into the Atlantic area, they either have the choice of going up here or maybe they cross over uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, that area, Jamaica, and come up. And then if they go into the Gulf of Mexico, these are typically very warm waters, and so they can really gain their strength. So sometimes a hurricane will come up here, hit land, bounce back out, come over land again, and then come back in and hit the ocean here in the Gulf of Mexico, refuel and hammer in here. Kind of the case in point about Hurricane Katrina, if you have a history on that one. So what's a tropical disturbance? This is a discrete tropical weather system of organized convection originating in the tropics or subtropic latitudes, having a non-frontal uh, migratory character and pain, maintaining its identity for 24 consecutive hours or more. Tropical disturbances are generally 125 to 375 miles in diameter. You know, people act like tropical disturbances are not a big deal, but I've been on a tropical island when one hit. This is not something you want to be around, but you'd rather be in this than the next category. A tropical depression. The big L over here represents a low pressure. Matter of fact, when you start watching the weather after this class, I hope that you'll start recognizing H's that have are usually blue for high pressure and L for is in red for low pressure. And that goes back to the... Uh, different types of frontal systems that we learned about in storms. Tropical cyclones with maximum sustained surface winds of less than 39 miles an hour. That doesn't sound like much, but I'm going to tell you what, it's scary when you're on a tiny little island with no protection. Uh, I was in an island in the uh, near the Bahamas when we got one of these and there was nowhere to go. I mean, not, the island was really tiny and uh, we were just stuck in our small little living quarters to wait this thing out. These storms begin to demonstrate closed circulation, so they're more dangerous than a distur uh, disturbance. And they're notated by the letter L because of that symbol is for low pressure systems. If you make it to a tropical storm, you get a name. And uh, so tropical storms uh, actually are cyclones with a maximum sustained surface winds of 40 miles per hour and more, but less than 73 miles per hour. So the 74 markers where a Category 1 hurricane starts. In Australia, tropical storms are referred to as a Category 1 cyclone and assigned an official name. We also assign official names to tropical storms. So when you look at tropical cyclones as they originate, like I said, a lot of ours come from the Africa area and work out this way. And we can also get South America pushing them into the Pacific. 
but the ones that are in the Gulf Coast region that affect most of the eastern seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico areas are generally created out here in the Atlantic. What's a typhoon? It's a tropical cyclone in which the maximum surface sustained wind is 74 miles per hour or greater that occurs west of the international date line in the northern hemisphere. So a super typhoon is the term used to, uh, for a tropical cyclone with sustained winds of over 150 miles an hour. That's about equal to a category four or a low category five hurricane on the Sapphire Simpson scale. So what's a hurricane by definition? It's a tropical cyclone in which the maximum sustained winds is 74 miles per hour or greater that occurs east of the international date line and they are found in the North Atlantic, Northeast Pacific Ocean, east of the International Date Line, and or in the South Pacific Ocean, east of 160 degrees east. So there's kind of a wide variety of places that you can find a hurricane. Major hurricane is used to describe a tropical cyclone with sustained winds of over 111 miles per hour, and this is category three, four, and five hurricanes on the Sapphire-Simpson scale. So let's talk about measuring hurricanes with that scale and how it came to be. Give you a little background information. Um, this came about as Hurricane Camille. So if you want to look up Hurricane Camille and learn about the story, Sapphire Simpson are the two gentlemen that communicated and actually saved the lives of a number of people along the eastern seaboard as a consequence of a prediction model that was brand new to the science and somebody said, hey, we're gonna have a serious storm surge in this location, we need to try to evacuate people. And uh, somebody listened and that had the authority and actually did that very thing. So it kind of led to the Sapphire Simpson scale. So when you see these little flags, what do they mean? The one flag right here is a small craft advisory that basically means that you've got 28 to 38 mile per hour winds that could be very devastating for small aircraft. My family, both of my parents were uh, small airplane pilots and so we used to travel a lot by plane for vacation. If we saw that kind of warning, we would land. A gale warning when you, when you see two flags, one on top of the other, and that represents between 39 and 54 miles per hour. I guarantee you we wouldn't have been flying in our little Mooney airplane uh, had one of those been out there. If we see a storm warning where you get 55 to 73 miles per hour, that's a straight flag with one square, then that would be uh, definitely looking for an airport immediately for landing, emergency landing. If you get hurricane warning, there's no reason for a small plane to be in the sky. The only planes that need to be in the sky during a hurricane are those that are going out to measure hurricane force winds or are designed to handle that. So that's 74 miles per hour and higher. So when you look at a category one, a couple of things to note. I want you to watch the barometric pressure as we go down the list, because each time you get to a higher category, that barometric pressure drops because you get a lower pressure system. And when you're talking about low and high pressure systems and weather, a high pressure system has a lot of weight on top of the earth and that's why it means the air mass weighs more. And in a low pressure system, it does not. So the lower the pressure, the more unequal heating happens and the more disturbance that that uh, storm can build, so it becomes more dangerous. So we'll start with the category one. The barometric pressure is 28.94 and the winds are 75 to 95 miles per hour. The typical storm surge is four to five feet. Why do I care about storm surge as well? Because storm surge is the largest and most critical factor that usually kills the most people. Um, case in point would be the 1900 Galveston hurricane. Let's pick a category two. Look what happens to the barometric pressure, 28.50 to 28.93. That doesn't seem like a big jump, but every time you move down a little bit and it gets more serious. And then you'll see a, uh, winds from, uh, uh, from, excuse me, from 96 to, they got a little typo here of seven, 96 to 110, and the storm surge should be six to eight feet. So you're gonna to start to see some moderate damage in uh, larger signs, tree branches blown down. This is not, a category two is not one to be messed with. Category three, 
your bathroom barometric pressure is dropping and it becomes, uh, once you get in the 27s, you should start to be concerned. 27.91 to 28.49, and it has winds between 111 to 130 miles per hour with storm surge between 9 to 12 feet. I don't need to tell you that that's going to be extensive damage and you're going to have trees blown down, you're going to have damages to buildings, you're going to have flooding. If you make it to a Category 4, your barometric pressure continues to drop at 27.17 inches to 27.90 inches, and the winds are 131 to 155 miles per hour. And then you're going to have storm surge between 13 to 18 feet. When you look at that, you can bury an inland city uh, that's, you know, they may be coastal, but you can get well past the coastline into the interior of the city. This is extreme damage. Almost all destruction of doors and windows will occur. And the Category 5, which is the worst type of hurricane you can have, you will have barometric pressure that drops uh, less than 27.17 inches, which is very low. And you'll have more than 155 mile per hour sustained winds with storm surge more than 18 feet. This is the worst kind of storm you would want to endure. Catastrophic building roofs are removed, structures are completely destroyed, and the storm surge can literally flood out an entire city. So our biggest concern besides winds is obviously storm surge because that's where people get caught and stranded. They think they can deal with the wind part and they get stranded and left behind. So if you are one of those individuals that owns property or lives along a coastal area, and a hurricane's coming. Board up your house, get your belongings, get your pets, and leave town, please, because you're putting in harm's way all the emergency response folks that have to respond to try to rescue people who are left behind. When you're looking at the Sapphire Simpson scale, this kind of gives you a view of what it looks like, and it's the same stuff that we just covered. But I kind of wanted you to just understand that there was a history behind how this particular scale was put together and a warning system now that is very recognizable. The colors are recognizable. The category designations are recognizable because it's become the common knowledge of people. Oh, I've got a category four storm coming in the Gulf of Mexico and it's headed straight towards Houston, Texas. Maybe we ought to do something about uh, our coastline. And uh, Galveston built a seawall. Was that a good thing? Was it not? We can have that discussion another day. So how are tropical cyclones named? They're named to, are named to provide ease of communication between forecasters and the general public. And I'd also throw out their insurance claims. That's why really big storms often aren't renamed by the same thing because a claim or lawsuits could be going on for years and decades and also out of respect for loss of life and property. Names were first used by an Australian weatherman and this weatherman disliked certain political figures so he named these horrible storms after them. During World War II, U.S. Uh, Army Air Corps and naval meteorologists decided to start naming storms after their girlfriends and wives. Later on, official names began to be adopted in 1945 by the armed services for use in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean basins. From 1950 to 1952, the North Atlantic cyclones were named by a phonetic alphabet, and in 1953, that changed again, the Weather Bureau switched to women's names only. In 1979, the list was in, uh, changed to include men's names for hurricanes and typhoons. And as of the 2000s, all tropical cyclones were, are named worldwide from a predetermined list. And there's usually a, a rotation list of five or six years. So the names are not always personal names. Some are food, birds, trees, etc. But most of them are proper names that you would relate to. Just for a couple of years, looking at 27, 2018, 19, 20, and 21, you could check out and see if your name's on any of these lists. Lucky mine didn't make it. But um, let's say that we make it to Hurricane, um, let's just say Hurricane Vents in 2017. And you're like, okay, well, what happened to all these other names? Well, they might have been hurricanes or they might have been storms, uh, but this one became noteworthy and because it 
became a, maybe a Category 5. 2018, maybe it's Helene. And 2019, maybe we don't have any storms. 2020, we end up with Dolly. 2021, we end up with Hurricane Peter being a very serious one, or Hurricane Anna. But they usually alternate between female and male names, and they alternate years. So if a name doesn't get used, the list will be revamped, and it's, uh, like I said, for one, two, three, four, five years sequentially, and then they'll rotate, rotate the list and take out the names that have been retired. So when you look at the designated Eastern North Pacific hurricane names, you can kind of get a gist that these are all predetermined lists, and they've been uh, named as not to be ugly, or it's just to give that commonality name to a storm so it's easy to refer to. When you retire a hurricane name, the names of tropical cyclones often are retired simply because they deem noteworthy because of damages and loss of life. And I would also correlate that back to my statement about insurance and court proceedings. Sometimes names are removed for cultural reasons, like Adolf from the return, uh, retired hurricane names in the Eastern Pacific. Kind of a dull moment there. Here are a couple of names that have been reti uh, retired, and you may relate to some of them. I meant, mentioned Hurricane Camille earlier. That was where the Sapphire Simpson scale came to be. Hurricane Andrew was notorious, uh, just demolished parts of Florida. Hurricane Katrina, all of you are alive to see that hurricane. Hurricane Ike alike, you, you saw that one. So these are names that have been permanently removed from the list, so they won't recycle in again. Historic hurricanes, the Great Hurricane of 1780, the largest hurricane ever reported in the northern Atlantic Ocean Basin, and postponed French assistance during the American Revolution, and almost every structure on Barbados was leveled. I've been to Barbados and seen some of the structures that were left behind as rubble that's a recognition of this particular hurricane. And in this hurricane, it lingered for a complete two days. Well, Barbados is a small, tiny Caribbean island, and it, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be on that island. Total North American deaths are estimated to be near 27,500 people killed by hurricane. It formed on about October the 3rd and broke up around October 20th. I might point out that's actually pretty late during hurricane season. Kind of an interesting uh, circumstance there. The exact track of the hurricane is unknown because there were no weather instruments to record scientific data at that time. The Galveston hurricane in 1900, you cannot have a conversation about hurricanes and not bring this one up. This represents the greatest loss of life in the United States, and it occurred on September 8th with estimated winds at 145 miles per hour, and it hit dead on before uh, Galveston ever had a seawall. So basically what you know as Dickens Strand or the, or you might call it the Strand in, in uh, Galveston, that represents the entire area that was just completely put underwater. Everything was damaged. So when we think about the his Galveston hurricane in 1900, no seawall in place. This entire area was just underwater. And it killed most everybody that was there. Just a select few people were able to survive. And storm surge was the cause of this. So here are some of the images of that. And I'll show you a quick little video. This video shows people working on the repair of this particular disaster. And it's so sad because it was so unnecessary. But we learned from our lessons, and Galveston decided as a city to build a portion of the city up by a certain amount of feet and made what's called the seawall. The irony is the seawall does not extend across the entire island uh, along the side facing uh, the Gulf. So there could be more of this to come in the future. When we look at that seawall, here it is now, and the seawall uh, was built, but it is not, like I say, continuous across the entire Galveston area. It was a major feat, and it was a major deal to try to protect Galveston much better for future Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. A few issues with the seawall. Here's one right here. <laughs> you can see it, and you're like, hmm, it stops. That's nice to know. So I'm not sure I would want to stay here during a hurricane because of storm surge purposes. 
I will tell you the seawall has done a pretty good job on the areas that it can protect and it's helped improve flooding in the downtown area of Galveston. But a seawall is an expensive uh, endeavor to build. And this was right after they had been in a major disaster. All their money is consumed with cleanup efforts. So the city's going to have to come up with a way to pay for this thing, a way to get it built, and then long-term maintain it. So when you're looking at just, oh, I can just build a seawall, it's not that simple. It's a long-term investment. Let's look at some science surveys. Christopher Columbus was the first European to ever document a hurricane in 1494. Doesn't mean he's the first human to ever see one. I don't believe that's the case at all. Just the first one to document it as a European. The average hurricane lasts about nine days from start to finish and has an eye wall that's 20 miles wide. Tropical cyclones are the strongest storms in the world, and the first 12 hours that that hurricane is on shore are the most destructive time of a hurricane. There are between six to nine hurricanes in an average season, and you don't want to be in the path of adversity when a hurricane comes your way. I endured Hurricane Alicia, and I was in the uh, suburbia of Houston, Texas, way along, away from the shoreline. I mean, I'm good. 60, 70 miles from the shoreline, and it did damage all over Houston, all the way to Katy, if you know where that is. So I can remember that um, going outside in the eye, and we see all the damage, and then the worst was yet to come. So when you're thinking about hurricanes, if you ever endure one, remember the worst is yet to come on the other side of the eye. Get to safety. Don't be a victim. I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.